Okay. So I'm going to start with my just my demo Emacs here, Eric. We're ready. If you are. Oh, uh, we are live. Oh, okay. Okay. So you're starting then? I guess I'll start right now. Here we go. So I'm a Windows user, as we talked oh, about no. yesterday. I'm going to try to uh, start Emacs for you now, and I've kind of got it pinned to this thing, but mostly what I actually do is grab a file explorer and head to my desktop where I have all sorts of Emacs. Eric, can you make sure that your VLC is muted? Okay. Handling problems in real time, right? Uh, oh, give me a second, please. Eric, can you make sure that your VLC is muted? Okay. Yeah, did, did you have the stream open on your side? I do. Okay. All right. We should be we should be working again now. My apologies for that. All right. Handling technical problems in real time is uh, what Emacs is all about. As we're coding, we're constantly making errors and fixing them and learning from the kinds of errors that we make and adjusting the editor to be easier to use. So today we'll try to build on uh, some of the ideas we introduced yesterday around how a community can help us learn Emacs faster and how we can think broadly about the people in our team when we decide how what kind of Emacs configuration we're going to have going for our project. So I'm just going to fire up my normal Emacs config now so that we get uh, hopefully a nice pretty demo or uh, at least some slides. And for safety, we're going to avoid the server because I hate it when it crashes. It's a little less stable under Windows, I think. And well, uh, while this starts up, I'll just briefly introduce uh, my lifelong friend and Eric uh, Elmshauser, who's hanging in the wings and, and waiting impatiently for us to be able to start our slides. Hello, Hello everybody. everybody. I'm Eric. So y you've heard plenty from me already this conference, um, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, so I'm just going to, uh, so Eric and I have worked things out so that he'll do most of the talking today. I'll drive us through some code parts, but the hope is that we'll just focus a little more on the game. And if you have questions about the game at all, please don't hesitate to ask those as well as your Emacs questions. And I think we're starting at welcome. And let's cut away here so we can show some faces. I lost you, Eric. Why there, would you do that? There he is. <laughs> and let's just do one more thing because that's just kind of offensive. I'm going to kill off that cute wallpaper we all were playing with yesterday. Although that's not so bad anymore. Oh, that's terrible. It's got to come back. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> oh, my dear. All right. And we just opened Emacs, so I have to open my slideshow. And there we are. Okay, Eric, I think I'm about as ready as I get. Cool. Well, well uh, let's, let's begin, begin here. here. Welcome, Welcome to the dungeon, dungeon everybody. everybody. As, As you're aware, I'm Eric, and this is Corwin, and, and we're, we're here to talk about the dungeon project that we've been working on for about a year now. now. Um, the, the dungeon game is based on a tradition of gaming that came out of the University of Minnesota back in like the 1950s, as far as we can tell. 
and it is a predecessor, an ancestor of most of the commercial role-playing games that you have heard of or maybe tried out from uh, various stores and friends and what have you. So, so <clears> one of the first things we want to talk about is what is it that sets Dungeon apart? Why is it, you know, what is it about this game that makes us want to continue bringing it forward when there are so many games already commercially available that are descended from it? Um, Dungeon is kind of a, a simpler game. Like, we don't, a, a lot of the mechanics that you think of about like what is it that defines your character stats and skills and attributes we just don't deal with in dungeon um but dungeon the, the simplicity, simplicity of, of it allows it, it um to be a vehicle, vehicle for, for creativity more than, than um just, just like, like numbers, numbers crunching. Crunching. So, so that's, that's kind of why, why we like it, it. But, but also it makes it a, a, a Tricky, tricky problem, problem when, when it comes, comes to writing a computer, computer game to mimic um, the, the game that, that we play with paper and dice around, around the table. table. So when we look at it as kind of like uh, a technology problem, whoops. When we try to, oh, hey, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of us. I'll I'll cut back. <laughs> I, I, I thought, thought we were, we're doing, doing fine. fine. Okay, well then I'll, I'll just, yeah, either way. So, so we've, we've been, been friends since, since um, um, it, was it was our parents' idea, idea. basically. Like, um, our parents are friends, friends uh, uh, and we learned this, this game from our parents. parents. Um, specifically, um, I learned it from Corwin when, when I was like seven or eight. Uh, yeah, that's where I, that's, that's, that's my cue in, right? So, um, yeah, my, my, my folks, uh, and, and Eric's folks were, were really tight. They used to run science fiction conventions together and it, yeah, we, our play featured, you know, imaginative role-playing. Usually we would find ways to work the computers in to things and, uh, uh, I don't. I don't know. I, I hardly have memories uh, that precede Eric. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, also, also it turns, turns out we're both kind of nerds. nerds. Uh, we've, we've been. Um, uh, I, I learned, learned to program, program from my, my mother, mother back, back in, in the, the early eighties, um, and for as, as long as we've been, been friends, friends, basically, we've, we've also been into playing with computers. computers. Um, over, over the years, years we've worked, worked with many, many, many different systems. systems. We, we played, played with Ataris and, and Apples and Amigas for a long time before either of us touched a uh, PC clone and, and uh, Windows, Windows or DOS or, or Linux, Linux or any of those systems. systems. Um, but, but we've been, been through all of them now and, and kind of uh, like them. So, so we also always thought, like, how is it that we can use these cool computers that we're into to, to build, build this dungeon, dungeon game, game that, that we're into, because that's, that's what, what you do, do right? right? That's certainly what we did. Um, so after some decades of bike shedding, where we saw really a lot of changes in the technology field, cell phones were invented, smartphones were invented, text messaging in particular had a dramatic impact on, on what we thought dungeon would have to be able to do to be more fun than scribbling in, in graph paper. Um, we were, we, uh, yeah, either way. We've been using Linux since the mid 90s. Um, I don't, I don't remember, remember exactly when I did my first Linux install, install but uh, I really liked, liked it from the get go. And, and um, I, think I think it was, was you know, of, of, of just, just shortly after I installed it on 486, I hauled it over to Corwin's house, house and, and we spent a couple of months um, screwing around with it. Uh, and I'll add, I remember the day that I learned about the formation of GNU. It, um, it had a life, I, I mean, I read lots of licenses. I, I think a lot of us have, uh, written our own swag license code and, uh, I definitely credit the formation of GNU to my being interested in thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. I am working the slides here. Okay. Well, um... <laughs> So, yeah, this is your turn. I already mentioned uh, Jeff yesterday, so your turn to take it for a few slides. 
Okay. okay. Well, I mean, um, you know, yeah, like, like it says, says well, along with learning Linux, Linux, we started learning the various tools, tools that were available through the GNU free software movement. movement. And, and um, it, it didn't, didn't take very long before we got into using the Emacs. Um, and when, when we were working, working as software developers um, back in the 90s, we both were using Emacs in an office environment with uh, some other developers. And it, I mean, it was obviously a very powerful tool. Um, and we have really enjoyed using it for a couple of decades since then. Um. I, I, I'm not going to go on at length about my love for Emacs here. So, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so we, yeah, so we put together a project and, and, and each time we rehearse this, Eric introduces it with, it's my story to tell, but since our flow is already to hell and we're just having a conversation with you today, um, I'll just jump in and say, from a project standpoint, the, the project owes its inception to a tremendous number of people in fandom that, you know, uh, encouraged us to just do crazy projects. And in this case, to our friends that were hanging out with us on Discord all the time while we played different games. And uh, through that, and while I was fooling with Emacs, as generally other people played games, uh, kind of the pieces fell into place and we were all there so we could talk about it and the idea got exciting again and we started going back to all the places that we had had trouble with it in the past and it really did seem to add up we built proof of concepts to do hard stuff quickly and i guess we'll probably head into that that area now <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so, yeah, yeah this, this slide, slide mentions why build a role-playing role game in Emacs. Emacs. And, and uh, as we were, uh, I was watching the last presentation, and uh, it, there was a slide about all of the problems that Emacs poses for retro gaming, where it interrupts the game loops and it waits for user input. And uh, that, that was like a whole list of reasons why Emacs actually does exactly what we want in our project. And Do you why Dungeon is kind of a natural fit for um, Emacs. Hey there. Hey. Um, yeah, go ahead and continue. I just got a phone call, okay. I think, from Leo, so I'm going to mute. Okay. So um, what we did in, in the project was basically come up with our minimum playtestable candidate. We listed all of the things that we need to be able to make the project do in order to recreate the dungeon experience that we had with paper and dice sitting around a table when we were kids. Um, and I mean, we, you know, it took a while for us to kind of tease apart the problem in a way where we could actually list out all of the features, like what are the problems we have to solve and how do we solve them? So creating any free software, any self-organizing free software project is, is challenging to start with. And we're generally people with a bunch of other responsibilities by the time we get to it. So it's it's not just hey you know the general herding cats it's it's you know trying to make it a part of your life too uh that being kind of a you know challenging battle we 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 kind of aligned on some some principles that we wanted to adhere to once we started taking the project seriously like you know particularly recognizing GNU in specific as we focus on giving back to the community, taking what we learned as Perl programmers and, uh, you know, bringing that spirit forward into, into our work and maybe specifically support, making sure that we can, um, you know, write, uh, functions for the game, um, in Perl if we want to. And then to use the game as a vehicle to make people look beyond the typically open source, or sorry, typically uh, nominally open source at best, generally pretty closed world of, of computer gaming. A lot of Windows users out there, a lot of free non-free communication tools, and a lot of uh, 
you know, a lot of ground to cover from a free software perspective. So what can Emacs do from a gaming standpoint to to open that up? Mm -hmm. And not to mention the hubris of the, you know, the two of us with a few friends basically deciding to take on what amounts to a huge project. Um, you know, we're essentially a year in now and we haven't really gotten over halfway to our minimum playtestable candidate. Uh, it's a it's a work in progress. We've got a long road to go. There's at least 50 items on the things that we think are critical to to be able to introduce it to my younger kids, for example. Um, okay, so we're in the, the accomplishments section. So we're supposed to be talking about the things that we have succeeded in doing in our first year. Um, we have succeeded in working with data in org documents, using org mode tables to uh, store the data that we're going to use in the various parts of our game. Um, and we've had a lot of success with svg.el. Uh, it started with drawing maps, and we have uh, another talk about our mapping specifically coming up next. So we'll put off some of that discussion for a separate talk. Um, but we've also succeeded in um, getting into a bunch of different elements of the game where uh, we're, you know, making a lot of progress using this drawing engine we developed to also draw this other thing and also draw this other thing and also draw this other thing. And it's, um, you know, we kind of backed into we've got this aesthetic and um, we're using it to draw interfaces for all of the different parts of the game. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about what, uh, what works now. Um, first of all, there's the mapping part that Eric mentioned, and we'll jump here into, um, we'll start opening up some files and looking around. Um, but then also later, uh, we'll, we'll fire up an eye elm and look at some of the, some of the other proofs of concept. So hopefully we can, uh, pivot the second talk more toward the demos as, as we skip some of the interactive stuff that might be mentioned in the slides that we go by. So maps, visual battle board. Um, the battle board is I'm just, how I'm just gonna please. I'm just gonna skip it, Eric. We'll we'll hit it in the next one. Okay. Hang on. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and open up uh, maps and let, let you talk from the from the SVG process itself, because that's the interesting part to me that uh, to me. Okay. Uh -oh. Talk about the SVG process. Like, what what do you think? And exactly, we want to talk about how we turn our data into an image, or what what are you hoping for? Yeah. So. I mean, did you did you want to talk more from from the SVG, the hand drawn SVG graphics at all? I thought we were going to save that stuff for the pathing talk. OK, but we can that's on right now. if you want. Yeah, I mean, so we've got about uh, 10 minutes before the turn where we thought we would first uh, take any questions that are hanging out there. I uh, unfortunately closed the etherpad, but I can open it again real quick and uh, or you can jump jump into the to the pathing stuff now, or I can just throw open an eye and we can start the demos. So let me invite uh, Amin or Sasha back in if you guys or Leo, if uh, any of you want to join the conversation, make a suggestion as to how we balance between the remaining time. The rest of what we have left starts in on toward the technical. So especially if there would be questions. Uh, questions about the game right now that would be awesome and I'm gonna get seated again I'm not sure if I talk over the stream um, if you'll hear it because I'm just watching your stream but I can try writing an IRC um... 
Sure. Yeah. Questions would be cool. Um, or, um, yeah, well, Eric, why don't you just go ahead and start walking us through the hand, hand drawn SVG stuff just a little bit. Cause I think if that isn't interesting to people, we can just preempt for a question. Okay. So historically, when we um, decided to actually start writing code, one of the very first things we wanted to do was the maps, because initially it seemed like the maps were going to be one of the biggest challenges in terms of how do we get a text editor to draw pictures for us. Um, we pretty quickly decided we wanted to work with SVGs because it allowed us to leverage the power of Emacs as a text editor and a text manipulator um, to write text graphics with the SVG format. So we did some SVG graphics by hand. We went in and just started hand coding things that looked visually like the maps we used to draw by hand on graph paper when we were, you know, sitting around the table. Yep, um, absolutely. What emerged from that is as we started working on um, some of these files, this particular image is a test of some 20 wide water uh, with some beaches around it and a, a special chamber kind of off to the side called a clapper. And this was the way we would code is by sketching by hand all of these things to look right. And then we would take that code and we noticed um, it became real repetitive as we would go like chunk of water, chunk of water, chunk of water. And we're like, okay, so what we really need is to define a set of, um, we called it tiles. Um, but like you could think of it as rubber stamps where we write this graphics code and then we're able to repeat it in different places around the map. Um, you want to flip over to code view and show that or do we want to move into looking sure. at the tile? tiles? Code view. So, you know, you can see just really obviously here, the only thing that's changing from chunk of water to chunk of water is the X and Y coordinates. Um, we're, you know, Pardon? we can skip getting into the SVG directives and how all of the path statements actually work, but you can trust us, all of these D equals and there's M's and H's and V's that turns out to be horizontal lines and vertical lines and cursor moves. And it's kind of like turtle graphics, if anyone remembers that far back. And we're um, picking up our pen and dropping it and drawing lines around on our map. OK. So we do have a few questions if you want to take them now. Otherwise, um, we can also sure, jump let's in. Get, let's get them while they're fresh. OK, sounds good. Um, so we'll probably shift to question and answer mode for up to 15 minutes here. So if you do have questions, um, maybe stack rank, go ahead and sort the questions <laughs> a little for us or comment on them to let us know which ones you want to see us get here. If we start getting a little long winded or not just along, we'll take direction, but, uh, thanks for your questions. Um, I'd like to see a demo as well. We'll look at that with the remaining time after this question block. Um, it, more about what the game is. Okay, sure. So let's let's take our uh, one minute each swing at what the game is. You want to go first? I called weapons. <laughs> okay. Um, dungeon is like role playing games, but you don't really do role playing. Like the for me, the thing, the core of being a role playing game is you take on the role of being your character and you play your character. And Dungeon's not like that. Dungeon, um, you can play, uh, so the, the Dungeon Party always has eight characters in it. There's four in the front row and four in the back row and you march through the dungeon fighting whatever you encounter. And if there's one player, you play all eight characters. And depending on how many players you have, you split up the party in whatever way seems fair and equitable to everybody. Similarly, I said the dungeon is kind of a simple game. Like there's only three races and there's only three classes. All of your characters are either human, elf, dwarf. They're all a warrior, a priest, or a wizard. And all of these characters have, you know, special properties and special talents that is why they come together in this party of eight. But essentially, Dungeon is a game about making up all of these 
um, eight characters and stomping through the dungeon, killing things, taking their stuff. Well, you're way over, but I don't know how much I have to add to that. I will just add well, that if if your uh, if if one's passion as a dungeon master is killing player characters, this game is meant for you. You don't have to build your game like that, but that's definitely a thing that people do with this game. Um, and then, as Eric said, it just encourages you to put your creativity on the table to bring all the different elements. Um, and this, hopefully this may be clear in our slides since we were a little fumbling for the first few minutes of the talk. But um, there's also a, a kind of a player's guide that, that I started a few years ago. Um, that's, that's not super complete, but, um, but does cover some of the high level basics of the game that, that Eric's been talking from. And I would add that some of the things, you know, some of what makes Dungeon great is that there's a lot of mystery about it. Like the player's handbook doesn't tell you all of the rules. Um, or like any, it is really. Mystery and like there's mazes and there's puzzles and you have to figure out how things work. And like we've got all of these treasure items in there that could help you deal with a particular monster if it occurs to you to use it. And, um, you know, like that, there's, there's a lot of, um, you don't know what's going on. You're dropped in the middle of this situation and you have to try and survive and level up and figure it out. And if you succeed in doing that for long enough, eventually you start realizing that there are big picture puzzles that there are, you know, there is more to this than just killing things and taking their stuff. And that's where the joy of designing these games comes in for me is like designing the mazes and designing the puzzles and like, oh yeah, and then they're gonna come out of this room and you know what they're gonna do? They're one and gonna, gonna go that way. So I'm gonna put the trap right there. <laughs> and they'll walk right into it every time. And then when the party does get in your map and they do exactly what you thought and they hit the trap, it's just really satisfying to watch the look on their little faces as they squirm and struggle to stay alive. Yeah, that's that's what I was trying to get at. Thanks. All right. That was perfect for me. All right. Um, so so highlight your question for me if you think it's important we grab it here before we jump into demos. But otherwise, I think it's time to try running some code. What say? Okay. I say do it. Okay, so you less less camera, more more Emacs now, and cool. hopefully I can find the right Emacs, uh, the right desktop. All right, there we are. So we'll try to fire up uh, and right now, and I usually like to do the full path to Emacs when I'm gonna run it under minus Q. All right. Let's have some IOM. All right, and then I'm also going to do a load file on the init script that you can find in the repository in the Emacs user init's uh, init scripts uh, users folder user folder nice and it's called init DM because that happened to fit with my naming scheme potentially terrible all right, and with that loaded, in theory, some very basic stuff will work even without us doing anything in IOM. So I think the, the last thing Eric was talking about was the SVG code behind the maps um, there as kind of the technical thread. So we'll just fire open the maps, pick a dungeon level. Let's pick a pretty one. Okay, if I show this? Yeah, whatever. Is that the surface? Yeah. And let's scale it here, I think, if but I recall that. The surface is that fun. Like, once, once we got the engine up and running a little bit, we decided to do some experimentation about seeing what we could do to push um, the limits of our tile engine. So we more or less, on the surface map, I basically started with almost no 
tiles from below, like the water and the beaches and the general store and the stairs were existing tiles. But then we were, were like, this is going to be a surface map, so we're outdoors, so I want hills and I want trees and I want grass. And um, it took a little while playing with SVG to come up with some acceptable code. But once the like the grass gets tiled out, it kind of you know gives the illusion of grass. And uh, you know these are all, in my estimation, kind of crude graphics. But we're at the proof of concept stage, and it definitely proves that we can use our graphics engine to decide what we want our maps to look like, and real quickly compose new map tiles and uh, stamp out a bunch of new maps. So now I'll uh, show off one of the other things. So the next thing we did once we once we had the maps doing, and we haven't gotten into the features of the maps, we can, we can appoint time to that or not, but um, there are a, a number of fa uh, feature, features there that we can look at. The, uh, we then wanted to try to see if that could make other interfaces more appealing. So we built stuff like, oop, that's gonna be the map again. Um, I'll just run it here through IOM so it's more obvious what I'm doing. Um, so let's look next to the character sheet. Oops. Back and Alt P doesn't work. Okay. That's a bummer. Uh, that is not auto loaded. So this, this project is a bit of a mess right now, y'all. It does some stuff that's really exciting to us, but the code is terrible and we need all the help we can get, uh, being told what our problems are and how to fix them. So that is, if you take nothing away from this talk, uh, take away from it that we could use your help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that doubles back to uh, when we were talking about Larry Wall's cardinal virtues of programming. Like, we definitely took on some hubris thinking we could do this. And we might not be wrong, but um, we could do it easier with more hands, you know? Many hands make light work. All right. I'll bite. Yeah. And the character sheet won't load for us today. I had some problems with my version control. I had to revert my thing. I, I uh, threw all my local changes in a stash, and it's it's a terrible mess. Let's look at stuff I tested already today uh, before. You got the battle board available? Let's find out. Is First, we'll load library it. Uh, in fact, actually, your basic require should work. No, uh, I can try load library. Uh, you know what? Let's for I'm just gonna go ahead and give it to you as a lab beast, since that's probably more fun to watch. So we'll take it from my own Annette. This is more likely to be healthy, since only some of the time. Uh, first we have to uh, Control X Alt I D M. All right, and having then loaded. The init, control U, F9, should give me the maps. And we can verify things work in a basic way just by changing level. Let's look at something else. Um, I mentioned there were a number of bindings. Show them briefly. Um, we wrote our own functions to handle movement. Some of those in svg.el, the left uh, left and right movements didn't didn't seem to work quite quite likely coding of course. Um, all right, enough. So let's let's see if Battleboard works now. Oh, I really thought that was on F7. Oh, that's the character sheet. Sweet. That's why you well, stay out of user bindings. <laughs> So that looks a little better. So let's talk about the character sheet. Yeah. So the character sheet was our first big uh, repurposing of the engine that we couldn't do. Uh, the Battleboard program that, uh, let's see if that runs now too.
Uh, it's not interactive if it does. You have it on F8? Good. Nope. Try it. Let Semex guess. No joy. All right. I'm not sure what's up with the battle board, Eric. We haven't messed with that one for a while. In fact, um, we had discussed using its code as an example, so maybe we'll debug it with you. Um, I'll certainly check for <laughs> questions first. Um, the uh, So the character sheet, which is not scaling ideally here. Let's see if reloading it does anything. Nope. Not as far as I can tell. Assuming um, You don't have this scale implemented for character sheet? That's right. There's the, everything in scale. It to, in order to get what you were looking at there, <laughs> all right, this, uh, this whole thing is hard-coded basically to the gills, except for things like this. This program represents a re-implementation of the draw engine using um all of the same things let's see that's selected so uh we'll just try bringing up a map again there's one and you'll notice um dm map doesn't know anything about the new draw engine and there are a couple of places where the new draw engine is still hooked in to the uh, for example, particularly the sizing of the graph paper background. So I've started the work in dmdraw.el of trying to show how exactly we did this, removing the how did we get data out of org mode that I talked about yesterday with our ETL flows, and just focusing on what, how did we solve the problem of predicated drawing, which I realized we didn't really talk about. So should I jump into that? Yeah, I guess. Uh, how are we on time? We have time for detours? Um, yeah, it looks like we could spend two or three minutes on that and then uh, come back for the questions. Cool, do it. And I'm just going to peek into my org mode, uh, into my chat conference, and I don't see anybody talking to me from the organizer channel, so I'm going to assume that's a good guess. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so let's let's go ahead and play with the map a little then. That is uh, pretty fun and and uh, so much fun that we had to curtail play sessions in order to keep working on the project. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, I'll I'll do the um, we'll, we'll try to find something different from any GIF I've shared here, right? Okay. So here we are in a random. Sp Go ahead, Eric. You fill. <laughs> oh, okay. So what what we're what Corwin is doing here is he's about to put the the map into play mode, um, which is going to turn on the fog of war, and then we're going to use the fog of war and the the play mode to kind of reveal the map one square at a time, like we would during a play session. So we'll just drop the party randomly somewhere onto this map. Looks like we're on Alpha Maze level three here. And um, uh oh, then, then we'll walk around a little. Okay, so there we go. we're halfway there. I'll have to I'll have to do a full redraw. Uh, the sketch, the sketching stuff has 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 broken things here. Like I said, the two aren't separated. Once I run them in the same instance, they're not predictable. Okay, so let me elaborate here. When he says the sketching stuff, the current um, focus of our work is to turn all of this map stuff we've got into a basically a WYSIWYG map editor, um, where we can get into the tiles and uh, we'll be able to select a tile and basically rubber stamp it into a map uh, graphically and then save the map file out and load it back in later so that um, we're able to you know just pound out these maps real fast um, using a, a graphical editor rather than having to hand code every symbol and every square of the tables so the process of doing that um, yeah we sort of 
Like I hate them. Things are a mess. We've got covers off. There's wires hanging out. Um, different stuff works on different days. Well, I will say in our defense, this is exactly why we staged a complicated thing. And uh, probably we should have just gone with that instead of trying to give you uh, the experience of, of, of what it's like uh, to use Emacs to do this, which is, which is sort of the last minute thought there. And my apologies for that, if that's made it harder to follow the thread. Let's check back now for questions and see if anybody wants to redirect at all. So, yep, this, so what you're looking at all uses prog pragmatic SVG, uh, SVG generation uh, for question number four there. Have you played with generating SVGs pragmatically in Emacs? That is what yeah. the maps are doing um, in terms of... Uh, we I should mean, have been maybe more explicit about that. We started hand coding things and once mm -hmm. we got the the idea of what the code was going to look like, we switched to doing it programmatically. So um, we were going to open up maybe now, if we've got time, we can get into the tile set real quick. Sure. Because we definitely didn't do any of the pathing slides. And so now we've skipped over some stuff we were going to present. Yeah, that's right. We've, we skipped a whole bunch of slides and I can certainly uh, go back to them. They're open here, obviously. Um, Right, I was just showing off the sketching tool uh, briefly in that context, but I think you're right. Let's, we can jump over to the, actually I should finish with this now having teased it. So let's do the yeah. same thing here, control H M and you'll see in this case, there are very few key, bi key bindings that are set up. Um, even this uh, shift delete has a tear uh, or shift with, uh, yeah, control delete. It would seem to be so that has a couple obvious bugs with it right didn't pick it didn't pick up those control points until i reused them not clearing that stack um and also should probably think about whether the uh, origin should return and hey marking that origin would be nice so there's a tremendous amount to do here this is just uh showing that it is possible to use essentially like a touch input to um uh to sketch out shapes. yeah and then also we can uh, switch over to our place tool and um hopefully we can get a nice big menu of all the tiles that eric prepared for the game maps uh that was probably a terrible choice but there you have just a bit of corridor right <laughs> that looks uh, and even the click, at, yep. And this, this click action here is the last thing I was working on before I dropped everything to, to build the decks that uh, we will soon share for this conference. So, okay, back to the tile sets. Right, so the way we approached drawing it programmatically is we broke our code up into little snippets we called tiles. Um, Corman's going to open up a tile set here. Basically, each tile has a name, and then with that name, we place data into different layers of the image. Uh, some of the layers are just SVG paths, and the data is just SVG uh, commands, um, like we saw in that handwritten code, and some of it is compositions of other um, tiles. So a tile can be made up of other tiles. Um, furthermore, some of these tiles have conditional code in it where like uh, some of this stuff is talking about elf and bang elf. Um, so the map is going to be drawn differently depending on whether or not there's elves in the party. Um, so the and that's the demo they broke. <laughs> the engine has to make all those decisions um, and that's what we're calling predicated drawing oh, there's a, a special room here. Do you have any elves? You do, so I draw it the there is elves way. Um, yeah, so uh, we built up the set of tiles and then um, we basically made map files which take um, our map and break it up into X, Y grids and then we drop these tiles into positions on the map. 
So we can use the same tile square after square after square. When there's a corridor north-south, it's the same tile over and over again. And that um, makes it easy to reuse the code. And then also when, uh, when we go to present um, the, what am I trying to say? The, the drawing in, in fog of war mode, as we move down the corridor, we can just add the necessary code one bit at a time to the visible image so that what we're displaying doesn't contain any data except what the party has already discovered. So we and thus we have kind of that. spoiler rich documents sitting on the GM server and then less, you know, and spoiler free data that flows down to the org mode uh, files on the player system. And the only real challenge is making sure that the, the, nothing that the game does can mess with the, the, the users, the, the players data file in case they might have their own notes and things in it, that, that would be the one, uh, you know, number one thing to avoid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Another thing we can talk about here is that there are layers. Um, you can see this table at the bottom has tile and overlay. The overlay column is just going to contain some actual SVG XML style tags. Um, so that's where we can add whatever text elements or other SVG, like raw SVG tags we want. Whereas a lot of the other layers are going to be like path layers. We've got water layers and beach layers. And our plan was to have a style sheet that defines how each of those layers are represented. So like when the water gets drawn blue and it's got arrows on it, giving it direction, um, all of that can be customized with a style sheet to change the water to be whatever you want. And like we have beaches as yellow, but maybe you like beaches as red or, you know, whatever. So we also built some test programs um, and various of the, the, I'm not, not sure what kind of shape we're going to find these in, but we can try running them. Um, here, for example, is just a very basic all of using a same using the same file to define the tiles and and then uh, the layout so to speak oh look at that uh, there's the layout okay so that actually looks fine tile and it's pat so this is defining a tile named C's and uh, it's gonna have a list of tiles defined above um, and you'll notice also that we can just sort of freely define and redefine and it sort of figures out, oh, this must still be part of the B row. Um, we could also have done this. Uh, uh -oh. yep. Okay, so this, this would work as would this. One of, uh, early on in development, when we were talking about getting data in and out of these org tables, it um, was kind of a priority to us to leave the way the data is organized open to the users and to the dungeon masters. So while we set our tile set apart from our map sets, um, this clearly shows that you can cram a tile set and a map into a single file. So in situations like the surface where we're using different tiles from other maps, maybe it makes sense to move, you know, those tiles just into the file with your map. Or like it's hard for us to predict how other people are going to want to use this when they design their games. So we wanted to leave it as versatile as possible about how you can use it where it matters, right? Not support every feature in the world. I can't count the number of times I said, Eric, 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 hey, if we do it like this, people will be able, and he just like, does it have to do that? Do we, do we, does it like, do we need it right away? <laughs> uh, do you have to really rewrite everything so it can all do that? And uh, a lot of those, a lot of those conversations too, but the the, the key flexibilities are really there. People might want to use a lot of different files. They might want to lay the tables out however they want. They have to be able to say, hey, this is a table that has data that's controlled by the game, and everything else in the file is not the game's problem. Mm -hmm. And our table, some of our tables started getting really wide, so we started striping the tables. 
where we'll repeat the same table over and over and over again to get all of the columns in there without making it, you know, a million miles wide. Yeah. Do you want to, should I go ahead and pull open like a level here? Do you think? Sure. Just or, to have shown it. Yeah, the tile set's a great example of striped tables. If you go look down like in the level change feature. Oh, sure. Sorry, I'm not quite sitting well to my keyboard here. Maybe I can just readjust things real quick. So what, you know, you can see here, like some of these tables got real wide when we're stuffing SVG tags into them. And what we, oh, maybe it's not in these. I thought it was special probably yeah no there there it is yeah it was in level change it does the table okay. you repeat okay great you were just going up, up and down so fast i didn't realize so this first table we've got path and what is that stairs so the stairs um level is one that draws in like a pink color to highlight places where you can change level and then if we scroll down to the second half of this section the second table is going to have all of these same tiles in it, but instead of path and stairs, we're going to have other columns. Can we see the next table? There we go. So the same tiles, only here we've got overlay, documentation, and behavior. And I guess we haven't talked about this at all. The behavior column was um, our concept of a way that we could attach um, functions basically to these different areas of the map because sometimes when you enter an area we want it to do something like when you enter a stairs down maybe we want it to change to the next level and draw the stairs up behind you and draw you where you are on the next level so these are like hooks where we could attach functions or you know macros or whatever to make the map have these behaviors as we get further towards automation. Cool. Um, so that's, that should be pretty close to our time. Um, you want to look at any other questions or just say goodbye? Um, yeah. So there's the, I, I'm sorry, we couldn't show it earlier. There is the battle board. Um, and so this is used just to keep track of hit points. So with this example, battleboard, uh, dmbattleboard.el, there's there's a complete example of not only in a single file re filling out the the cells and the tiles, but then coming in and uh, keeping the org mode file in sync with with clicks. So and I can press the star key and set my damage to minus one and take the damage back off. I just haven't spent a lot of time building up fancy bindings for this. You'll also find that the crew probably find how I figure out what was clicked on in the code hard. But if I just assign something recognizable for damage and then come into, um, it will now have opened the org mode file behind the scenes because it's changing it. Um, and we can then look at that file a little bit and hopefully that is un, uh, large enough you can kind of see there's our 17 damage landed in armor the logic that sits behind that to figure out the part of the screen is not um, necessarily our finest work <laughs> uh uh, was, but it but it does work in this one. That kind of stuff was used on the map a little bit too. We didn't really get to show that in the demo. But as you're scrolling around, there's like a highlighter um, that that you know we were drawing on oh, the sure. map to show you which square you've got selected because um, we were having trouble with that code initially, and we were sometimes revealing the wrong map. Okay.
And I don't know how we're set for time, but I just saw a message um, from Trixie that she could jump on if we want our... Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, go ahead and invite her in. I'll just cut to the scene as soon as she's in. I think... Uh... Yeah, yeah, so we're reaching the Ask Me Any Anything uh, portion of the program here with what uh, with what time we have left for your questions. Um, please correct me if we're still like ten minutes, you know, if we're if we're more than like fifty to twenty minutes from our time. But I, I suspect we've left way left way less than that. And uh, out of respect for all the other presenters. Um, Uh oh, Ooh, I don't want to close that, actually. Hmm. I think I may have found an old version of my slides that could have some good stuff. <laughs> it's been an event for a couple of weeks here. I had a break in and uh, my somebody got into our bank accounts and uh, nasty business. Just a lot going on over over this whole year, I think. <laughs> Do, do we have more questions to shag or where? Sure. So uh, I think there was at least one we deferred a little bit. Uh, what the game is. Uh, always eight characters that can be divided. Right. That's so always eight characters that can be divided between the party is the classic formula. It actually works pretty well for a conversational group. Remember that role playing games are about talking to each other and being good at them is about taking excellent notes. So when you're sitting around with a group of people and you're going to have to wait for them while they dig through their notes and listen to all of the things they find interesting to say and try to reach an imaginative place that you can stay together while you're doing all that and working in dice and remembering the rules, it's actually a complicated activity. I liken it more to a bridge game than to like, a, you know, Parcheesi or perhaps even like Risk or Axis and Allies or other games that have, have definitely the strategy to them, but... I don't know. Eric, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. Um, you know, yes, definitely. The the tradition is to always have eight characters in the party. And, you know, one of the great things about Dungeon is that everybody who writes their own dungeon gets to write their own rules and is free to change whatever you want. And that being said, I've certainly seen people try to take on challenging that always eight characters in a party thing. Um, I've seen people take approaches like every player gets two characters and then you can have a party ranging from two to ten. Or there's always going to be ten or there's, you know, this or that or people have um, tried stuff. And none of it has really worked out very satisfactorily. We always seem to keep coming back to our um, party of eight. Yeah, um, it's... I, 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 it, it's one of the there things is no that rule of dungeon that you can't change when you write your own dungeon. And that's the reason it's so complicated as a, as a software project, why it's taken us decades because trying to model the data, for example, or uh, really any attempt to quantify it in specific terms always falls to examples. Well, you know, dungeons usually have elves, elves, dwarves, and humans. They have uh, priests, wizards, and warriors. Uh, they have eight characters in the party. The Belrogs are particularly nasty and live in a room of some specific shape. Um, spoilers. Uh <laughs> right. And we don't tell you the rules. And that's what you know. And you sit down at the table and you say, what's your character name and what's your special power? And and then I say, uh, I, yeah. I, I, I'm i Zelda and uh, I have this bridge that I can put down that always gets me across the river. Um, so let's touch on special power real quick, since that's one of the things that is kind of unique to Dungeon. And one of the things that is the biggest challenge to us in trying to code a system like this for automated play. And that's that every character gets a unique special power. And traditionally, you negotiate your special power with the dungeon master when you create your character. And occasionally throughout the course of the character's life, their special power might change due to game circumstances. Usually it improves, but sometimes not. 
Uh, and uh, that's those are the most fun conversations, right? Sometimes we have fun gaming sessions where we barely get all the characters created and started because we get off into arguing about the special powers. No, Zelda's special powers, obviously. The candle, come on! Also, that was Link, not Zelda. Mm-hmm. I still have my t-shirt from when Hey, I was there she is. Let's cut scene. Let me go Zelda on you. <laughs> you get to deal with fun filters today because that's what we got going on over here today. All right, I'm going to recut everybody. Hang on tight. All right, okay. there's Eric. This is going to be Eric for a second, hope. No worries. And welcome to the welcome to the stream, uh, Trixie Horror. Uh, oh, thank you. Who is uh, one of our project team members? Somebody who's learning Emacs as part of the project. And um, yeah, I I particularly wanted to invite you on to talk about your experience learning Emacs. I think you have run into places where it's a pain in the butt to learn Emacs, and that this is a safe space to talk about that. <laughs> Jump into that by saying um, the Emacs cheat sheet. Um, I think it's the one that GNU puts out is a lifesaver. A um, little bit of a vocabulary disconnect, like, and this actually kind of comes up a lot in conversation with Corwin and Eric and I, but copy paste versus what, yank and W, whatever W. Kill and yank, for. yeah. Like, what? Why would you even do that to us, right? Where where were right. you when Xerox Park happened? No, I I understand. That makes sense. What else? That's I mean, you don't have to sit here and rag on Emacs, but we're here for that. That's all I'm saying. No, and like that's been the biggest thing. Like, I'm I'm used to like just kind of the, the very binary nature of like, nope, that didn't work. Try something else. So mm -hmm. as long as you're like willing to try other stuff, like Emacs will be fine. So it's a tough cookie. It can take it. Worst thing that happens is you have to re reinstall it and throw your init file that you hopefully have a backup of. Um, Fine. Um, Are there more questions in the hopper? Or do, are if, we yeah, if anybody does have any questions up there, uh, for Hope, for Eric or I. So just to summarize, uh, I've known Eric. Uh, I've known Eric my whole life. I've known Hope around a decade. We worked together on a project for uh, for a science fiction convention. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond conventions, and then I also helped with. I just wrote a bio. So this should like all theoretically be in my head, right? Um, <laughs> I want. I have to refer to my own bio. <laughs> so I'm the project coordinator for Dungeon Mode. Hey, I'm I was a bird assistant for Good the convention. Good credit. I respect I'm a programming that enthusiast and family friend to the Bruce. Oh. Um, that's nice. <laughs> Uh, we've gotten a ton of support from a lot of our lifelong friends pe and, and also people that we just met. Maybe that's a that's a great segue. Um, do throw your questions in there. I'm going to fill for just a second and then we'll probably cut away. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, thematically, actually, that's that's too abrupt. So we need to go around the room. Eric, you had hours and hours to rehearse. Hope kind of jumped in on the last minute. So let's let's is it okay to pick on you or do you want me to give mine? Uh to what are you asking me to do? What do you what do you want people to take away from this talk? You know, as we think about dungeon and sharing its sharing its tradition, as we think about learning Emacs and like making that awesome. Um and just, you know, generally what's up with free software and trying to make computers a tool to make people freer? Wow, that's like five questions. Yeah, so just I'm gonna start with Dungeon. Jump in. Um, I think that Dungeon is a lot of fun, and uh, you know, I'm I've played many commercial role-playing games over the years, and I've enjoyed all of them. 
And there are very few of them that I've had as many belly laughs and as much just joy playing as from Dungeon. And I think, you know, the magic of it is, you know, like any game, like the real magic is the people you play with and having fun with your friends. And what I would hope that people can take away from is that Dungeon has the ability to be that magical thing. And hopefully we can get our project to the point where it gets out of the way and lets you have that fun with your friends. Um, but there's a lot of work to do. We could use some help. So if you're interested in having fun, come help us build this fun tool. All right, so I just got the call that we've got just about two to three minutes left, and we should start our wrap-up. <laughs> okay, wrap-up. So, yeah, um, so I'll, I'll see if I can charge the room with some energy unless you, you're ready to have at it, Hope. Here, here's, here's what I want people to take away. Were you like, no, okay. I'm not getting your audio, Hope. It's okay, okay on, on my end. end. Maybe I just need to speak up. up. Is this better? Let me know when I'm coming through. Yeah. I'm just You're coming through now. You. Okay, cool. Um, no, I was going to say go ahead. I didn't. Okay. I, didn't have I mean, I, I don't know that I know what I want to say either, except a whole ton of thank yous. So I will I will save those for the, for the literal end here. And instead, what I would say is as we build our amazing innovations and explore our ideas in Emacs, we are fighting our own ego for the will to get them done. It's hard and we're not sure if they're going to be a good idea and will it excite people. And part of our responsibility is to excite people so that they can feel good about liking them. If you come off and you're like, hey, this is a terrible idea, it's really hard to be like, no, I love that idea. It works theatrically, but in larger groups may not scale. So that's a crucible for ideas and a crucible for teams. The first part is definitely healthy. The second part, there's a lot we can we can do, you know, having a front and 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 good faith conversations on that subject. Anybody else want to want to wade in after that? Sorry, that that was more of a calm down than a than a fire up. No, oh, that's okay. Um, I think I mean it's the first part of this, but I think um, we would be remiss not to highlight org mode a little bit since if yeah, I'm not hear mistaken, that. like that's that's our bread and butter. Yeah, our whole project is built really, on org mode, right? And I'm just really excited because like I have. I don't have ADHD, but I have like something similar. And so like to know that there's something that exists that is like purely hierarchical is incredible. Like I can just run a report basically and get all of my like to-do lists that I didn't have to put in one specific place. Um, and like that's kind of been uh, a complex issue for me of like, okay, I have all these to-do lists, like in Google Keep or whatever, like what do I do with them now? So being able to like pull them into one list and then just cycle through them is really incredible. Um, and I think taking Dungeon and like using it to, like combining it with org mode basically, um, really, yeah. I'm excited about it and I'm excited to see like what it can do for player groups. Uh, and yeah, kind of, especially, especially now that quarantine, like I was excited about dungeon mode um, before the pandemic and now like I'm only more enthusiastic. So, yeah, uh, definitely the pandemic has been the greatest thing that happened to this game. Terrible, terrible as it is to say that it, it we uh, needed a hobby and it turns out role playing games are, are a really good <laughs> fit. <laughs> yep. So. Um, so I think that's probably about our time. Um, I'm guessing that's my call. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. We'll be around for Discord and stuff later. Come catch us if you want to talk. <laughs>